Well, greetings and welcome everyone to our online Sunday morning service. We do miss seeing everyone face to face, but I am confident that very soon we will be able to celebrate together again as a church family. I want to encourage all of you that God has not abandoned you in all this. Though you may feel alone right now, I encourage you to continue to read his word and spend time, spend time talking with him in prayer. I personally am so thankful that our trust isn't in the wisdom of man to deal with this situation. Psalm 146 says, Do not put your trust or your faith in princes or in men or in our worldly leaders. Man does not have the authority over life. Only God does. Deuteronomy 31 says, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's a promise from God that God is on our side, and he's looking out for us. So just continue to trust him during this time, and he will reveal himself to you. Why don't we open with prayer this morning? Hallelujah. Father, I just lift up all the people that might be hurting, might be confused or lonely or discouraged. I pray that you'd encourage them right now. I lift up the workers that have to be out uh, working among uh, the stores and the police and all the different areas that people are out working, uh, those taking care of trouble calls. Lord, I lift up the families that have lost loved ones. I pray that you'd strengthen them during this time. Wrap your arms, your loving arms around them. And that, Lord, in everyone, that you would breathe a, a breath of life today into each and every person. And we just give you the thanks in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.
your side. You never leave us, and you do never, ever forsake us. Father, we thank you that we can trust you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, today that we can come before you. We can lay everything bare before you, Lord, knowing that you know everything about us and that you love us anyway. Thank you, Lord, that we can place our lives and our entire futures in your hand. We thank you, Lord, that we can come here this night and we can speak to you and we can just sing these songs of praise to you, Lord, and that we can look into your word and hear what you have to say to us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son dying on the cross in our place and for our stead. And we thank you, Lord, that he comes as our Savior and that we can know him personally. We just ask, Lord, now as we go into your word that you would help us to not just hear what you have to say, but to do it as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Greetings again and welcome to our Calvary Chapel online service. It's so good that we can actually have this medium available to us when we can't actually meet together in the same room. Well, I was watching TV this week, and there was a show on called Off the Grid Builders. And it was about these people who want to live, well, we would have called this back where I come from, we call this, they want to live behind God's back. They want to be all the way back out in the woods, away from everybody, and that's absolutely fine. But the episode that was on struck me because the people who were building had absolutely no building skill or experience whatsoever. 
This was the weirdest, strangest thing I've ever seen. This was a, a mother and son, and they were in Hawaii. They had three acres of land in, in the rainforest in Hawaii, and they had to get a bulldozer and clear this out. And then from there, they had to go on and then go to build. Now, as I said, they had absolutely no skill and no experience in building whatsoever. So early on in the show, they're going to a class that's trying to teach them how to mix concrete in a lighter way so that it's a more sustainable way to build. And so they do this, and they learn how to mix the concrete, but like I said, there's no experience here at all. So they go, and they're, they're starting to build, and they, they lay this foundation. The foundation is uneven, and they're just mixing concrete and throwing it on there. And I'm watching this show, and I'm like, what are these people doing? And I turn to Angela, I'm like, what are they thinking? What are they actually doing here? And they pour this out, and it's pouring rain. It's pouring rain, and he's got this, this contraption that he's mixing the concrete with, and it's plugged into a generator. And every time he hits the button, he gets shocked. And he's saying, ah, it's shocking me every time I try to use it. And I'm saying to myself, I'm no builder, but it's raining, it's plugged in, you're getting shocked, you might want to stop. You might want to stop this. He goes from there, and then they, they have this little structure on, the build, on their property that they were going to build on, and they have to tear down the structure. So they pull the structure down with ropes and, and their, their truck, and they pull it down, and then after it falls, they take the wood and they try to burn it. It's the middle of the rainforest. The wood won't burn. So what they end up doing is they take their, their tank of gasoline and they douse the wood. And the guy takes out a lighter. And I turn to Angela, I'm like, he's not really going to do that, is he? He does. <laughs> he goes and he lights it. And the flame flies up. It takes all the hair off his legs, just misses his eyebrows. And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, that gasoline really is powerful. <laughs> yes, it is. Long story short, they, they finally get this thing done. And I, as I watch them build, they go after, through setback after setback. And I say to myself, what is giving these people the confidence that they can actually build this structure? They build it anyway. They build it, and it looks like a piece of garbage. I have no idea why anybody would want to live here. And he's building this to bring his wife there for the two of them to live. She gets there and she thinks it's the most beautiful place in the world and she can't wait to move in. And I'm dumbfounded. There's an episode coming on afterwards, so I have to watch that too. So the next episode comes on and this guy at least has some skill in building, but he doesn't have any water on his property. He's in the woods in Vermont and he has no water on his property and so he gets a neighbor to come help him find water. And the neighbor has this stick that looks like a, a big wishbone, and he's holding the two ends like this, and he's walking around the property, and he says, wherever there's water, the head of the stick will just drop. And I'm like, okay. And he walks around the property for a few minutes, hmm, and the stick drops. And then he goes from the other side and comes over, and he walks to that same, near to that same spot, and again, the stick drops. He says, Right here, you'll find water. And I'm saying to myself, you've got to be kidding. There's no possible way this is going to work. And this guy comes and he takes his shovel and he's digging, 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 digging. And of course, the guy who had the, who had the, the stick in his hand, he's just standing to the side. He's not doing anything. And the guy, he digs four and a half feet down, no water. And the guy says, I don't know, thought it would be water there. I bring that up to say this. It's such a picture to me of us as human beings wanting to do things our own way. It's a picture to me of us as human beings wanting to ignore what makes sense, God's way, and do things our own way. We want to come to our own salvation in our own way. We want to do things, like Frank Sinatra said, my way. It doesn't work, but that doesn't stop us from trying. In the passage today, we're going to look at Jacob as he's wrestling with things, and we're going to see how Jacob tries to do things his own way and what it works out for, it, for him. It's not going to work out for him until he yields to God, but that's going to be a couple of chapters past today. So we're in Genesis chapter 43, 
today. We're actually going to start a little bit further back. We're going to start in Genesis 42 because we're going to pick up the story. It's been a little while since we've been here. And so what we're going to look at is when Joseph's brothers come back from Egypt after buying grain the first time. They've bought grain, they've come back. Joseph has accused them of being spies. Of course, they don't know it's Joseph. He said they're spies. He said, the only way you're going to see my face again is if you bring your younger brother back with you. And they come back and they tell their father about this. And this is how the reaction goes. So Genesis chapter 42, verse 30. The man, and they're talking about Joseph, the man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us. And he took us to be spies of the land. But we said, we are honest men. We have never been spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, by this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your household, and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you are not spies, but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land." As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they saw, and when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are about to make, you would bring my gray hairs down with sorrow to Sheol, or the grave. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, the man solemnly warned us, saying, you shall not see my face again, Unless your brother is with you, if you will send our brother with us, we will go down and we will buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel, or Jacob, said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down. And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge for his safety. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me blame the, to bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now returned twice. And we'll stop there for now. We're going to take a look first here at what I call Jacob's non-leadership. Jacob had four wives, and as we've mentioned already, that's three too many. He had four wives, and he has these, he has favorites. He's played favorites his entire life with these kids because he didn't have children with the wife that he loved the most. Her name was Rachel, and Rachel was barren for a long time. And when she finally had a child, it was Joseph. And we know that Joseph was the favorite child. He had had the heir to the family fortune. He was the one who was wearing the the coat of many colors. He was the one who was tattling on his brothers about what they did out in the fields. They didn't like him. They ended up throwing him in a pit, sending him to Egypt. And that's, you know, that's the part of the story we've already gone through. So he's played favorites his entire life. And his favorite wife, Rachel, She has another son, and she actually passes away in childbirth, and his name is Benjamin. Now, when Joseph sees the brothers come to buy grain, he says to them, he recognizes them, but they, of course, don't recognize him. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. He accuses them of being spies. He says, you can't come back into the land to trade and to buy grain unless you bring your younger brother back here. I was talking about this with Angela earlier and trying to figure out why is it that Joseph said this. And I can think of two possible reasons. One, perhaps he wanted to to see how they would treat their younger brother. Remember, Joseph was the favorite. He was Rachel's son. He's gone. That leaves Benjamin. He would now be the favorite, and he is also Rachel's son. How will they treat their younger brother when they have to bring him here? Will they treat him as they treated Joseph, cruelly? Will they treat him without any compassion 
in the same way that they treated Joseph? Or have they changed? Has there been any change in them since the last time he's seen them? Additionally, it's probably been over 20 years since Joseph has even seen Benjamin. When he saw Benjamin last, he would have been a youngster, a little kid maybe, and now he's a man in his 20s, maybe his 30s, and we'll find out later on that he already has children of his own as well. So maybe he just wants to see his younger brother. Whatever the case may be, he tells him to bring his brother. So we come now to the story, and it's interesting because Joseph kept Simeon as a prisoner until they brought back their other brother. And they, Simeon has been in jail all this time. How long has it been? We don't know exactly, but it's going to take about, about four to six weeks walking or riding on a donkey to get from Egypt to where they are in the land of Canaan. You have to understand how large the household was and how much grain they would have had to bring with them to sustain the household for a decent amount of time. It's about 250 miles to get from where they live to out into, into Egypt. So imagine for yourselves, we live here in central New York, imagine we had to ride down to New York City to buy groceries. You would probably buy more than enough to last for a long time because you don't want to make that trip all the time. Now that's four and a half hours by car. They were riding on a donkey. Donkeys don't get speeding tickets. These are not fast animals. They're taking their time going. And so it's going to take several weeks for them to make this journey. So they make the journey there. And what Judah says to his father is that we could have gone there and come back twice in the time that we've wasted. The chapter starts off by telling us that they needed to buy more grain. So however, meant, however much grain they brought with them, however much that was supposed to last them for, it's almost finished and it's time to go back and buy more. When Jacob first gets the news, when Jacob first gets the news, the first thing he does, is, as I mentioned, he's playing favorites again. He's playing favorites. Do you hear what he says? He's talking to his sons, and he says, I'm not going to let my other son, Benjamin, go with you. He says to them that Joseph is gone. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And Benjamin is the only one left. He's talking to all of his other sons and saying, I only have one son left. It's as though none of the lessons that should have been learned have gotten through to him as yet. He hasn't gotten the message yet. He's putting this division between his boys again. It's a terrible, terrible thing. He's doing it again. There's division, and then there's just denial. The chapter begins, he says, okay, go buy us a little more food. And I, I feel like everybody's sitting around the table looking at each other like, Dad, you know that we can't go back to buy more food unless we bring Benjamin with us. He's going to act like it didn't happen, like we can just do this anyway. It can't be done. There's no way we can go. We are not going down there unless we have Benjamin with us. And what is Jacob's reaction to that? Jacob says, why did you treat me so badly? Why do you treat me so badly? Why do you tell the man that you had another brother? And Judah's saying to him, well, Dad, the man very specifically questioned us. He said, do you have another brother? How could we possibly have known that he would have said to us, make sure your brother comes with you or you can't come back? You see, although Jacob has met, literally met with God and wrestled with him and been blessed by God and has had his name changed and has had the covenant reconfirmed to him, Jacob still falls back on old sinful habits. See, Jacob's name meant deceiver, one who grasps at the heel, one who supplants. And he lived up to that name throughout his lifetime. You know the story of Jacob taking the birthright from Esau and then stealing the blessing from Esau and how, what, type of, what type of turmoil that made in the family. And Jacob 
Jacob, he falls back on old practices. This is what he's used to. This is what he knows. And he goes back to old sinful habits. Why didn't you just lie to him? Is essentially what Jacob is saying. Why didn't you just lie? God wants to do a new thing in and through us. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that if we are in Christ, that we're new creatures, new creations. The old has gone, the new has come. That's what Christ wants for us. He's made us new. We are new in Christ. But sometimes when the stress happens, when the circumstances of life are what we don't expect, what we don't want, it's easy for us to just fall back into old sinful habits and patterns. We go back to what's familiar to us. If you used to lash out before, if you were sort of an angry person, when something happens and it really gets to you, all of a sudden you, you don't look too much like a Christian anymore in the way that you react. Maybe you used to drink to get rid of your issues or to, to forget about your problems, and all of a sudden something happens like this coronavirus and you're home for six weeks and you start hitting the bottle again. We fall back into old sinful practices. We're new creatures. We're new creations in Christ. And he wants to do a new thing in and through us. But we've got old sinful habits that we need to overcome. And it takes work to do so. It takes us yielding to the Spirit of God to change our nature, to bring that fruit of the Spirit out and through us so that we can do that. You know, when I, got, when I got married, I got four kids right away. And I'm actually very, very fluent in sarcasm. I'm really good at it. And I was told by my wife, I was told that sarcasm doesn't actually work with kids. It doesn't actually work with kids. But, you know, every time something happened, I throw a snide comment in there because that's my way. That's the thing I know. And I realized, as we started moving along, that, yeah, she's right. Kids don't get sarcasm, and when they finally do, then they become sarcastic to you. It's just a bad thing. How do I break that cycle? Well, you start thinking every time you're about to say something, stop. Let the Spirit of God give you something else to say, something better to say. And that's how he wants to work in and through and change us. His desire... His stated goal is to make us more like Christ. That's what he wants for us, so we can't fall back into the old sinful habits. But that's where Jacob is heading. His immediate thought is, why did you tell this man the truth? Why didn't you just lie to him? Jacob, no, you can do better than this. God has changed you. He's met with you. He's confirmed the covenant. He's blessed you. He's changed your name. He's made you new. And he's done no less than that for each and every one of us. He's changed us and he's made us new and he wants to work in and through us. Jacob wants to be deceitful. He says, why do you tell him the truth? And then finally, finally, Jake, Judah gets through to him and he says, listen, let us do this. Let us go down with there so we can get food so that we can live and not die. Not just me, but you, our little ones, everyone. We need this grain. We have to live. And so reluctantly, finally, Jacob agrees. Now, it's interesting to me because Reuben, the oldest son, Reuben actually made essentially the same offer. Reuben says, I will be a shorty. You know, you can kill my two sons if I don't bring Benjamin back. But what did Jacob say? Jacob said, no way, I'm not sending my son. But when Judah brings the same thing forward, he reluctantly but finally does agree to let Judah do so and to take Benjamin down to Egypt. What's the difference? Well, I think there are two reasons. One obvious, one not so obvious. The obvious reason is that at this point, when Judah makes this suggestion that we take Benjamin and go, they're running out of food. When Reuben made the suggestion at first, they had just come back with Egypt, from Egypt. All of the sacks were full of grain. They had food to last for some time. It wasn't an urgent situation. Now, though, the situation is urgent because they're running out of food. Now, remember, during all this time, Simeon's still in jail. Simeon is still in jail. And Judah, excuse me, rather, Jacob has actually said, Simeon is no more. 
He's treating Simeon as though Simeon is dead already. He said, Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you want to try and take Benjamin, not a chance. All right, that's one reason they're running out of food. The second reason we actually have to do a little dig for, because this is a very interesting portion, one little verse, and no commentary whatsoever, but it tells a lot. In Genesis chapter 35, Jacob has been traveling across the land with his family, and his favorite wife, Rachel, she's pregnant with a son. It's going to be Benjamin, but she hasn't had him yet. And she has him on the way, and sadly, tragically, she dies in childbirth. Right at that point, the Bible tells us, and this is Genesis 35, verse 22, it says, while Israel, while Jacob, lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Judah, excuse me, I keep saying Judah, Jacob's wife, Bilhah, this is actually Rachel's maidservant that he took as a wife when Rachel couldn't have children. When Rachel passes away, the Bible tells us that Reuben went and he slept with Bilhah, his father's wife. It's a Maury Povich show, I know. He goes and does this. What, what's going on here? The Bible says, and Israel heard of it. That's, that's Jacob. He heard of it. So, in my mind, when you read the next verse, the next verse should say something like this. And Jacob took him by the throat and choked the life out of him and then beat him across the face. That's what the next verse should say, but it doesn't. Jacob hears of it, but doesn't do anything. Now, somebody sleeps with your wife, this should be a matter of contention. There should be some conflict and not any resolution. There should be a problem here, and he doesn't do anything. He heard of it, and then the verse just goes on and lists the sons of Jacob. Now, he heard of it. He doesn't do anything. He didn't forget about it, because we'll see that in a minute. He never forgot about it. But we have to deal with something here, which we find out about Jacob, is that Jacob is a passive leader. He's very passive. He wants things to go by. He doesn't want to get involved. He doesn't want to get his hands dirty. He doesn't want to touch anything. We see this in more than one occasion, because Earlier in the book of Genesis, Jacob's only daughter, Dinah, is raped, and Jacob does nothing about it. Because he does nothing, his two boys, Simeon and Reuben, they go, or Simeon and Levi, two of his older boys, they go and they actually concoct a plan and they kill all the men of the town. And it's a terrible situation again, and Jacob's worried about it, and he doesn't know what to do, but he doesn't do anything. Because Jacob doesn't do anything, someone else steps in and does. Whenever there's a leadership void, someone is going to take over. It always happens. And passive men, passive male leadership, never does a family any good. We see it in Jacob's life. If we go right back to the beginning, we see it in Adam. Adam is there, he's in the garden, he's there with Eve. Eve's got a snake talking to her, telling her to eat the fruit that God told her not to eat of, and Adam's like, eh, you know, do what you gotta do there. And it says, she took the fruit and she gave to her husband with her. He was there. He was there and he let it happen. Passive male leadership. The void will be filled. I think the classic example of this is actually in someone that we think is a great leader, King David. King David's passivity actually ends up leading to a civil war in the country. David has a son who actually rapes his half-sister. David does nothing about it when he hears it. The Bible just says he was angry. He was angry, but he did nothing. When he does nothing, who steps in? his other son, Absalom. 
And Absalom has them killed. And then Absalom is banished from the kingdom. And then Absalom comes back to the kingdom. And then Absalom starts to steal the hearts of the people away from David. And there's a coup. And Absalom actually tries to, and does for a moment, take over the kingdom. And David and his men are on the run. A civil war because the leader was passive. He wouldn't do what he was supposed to. Lead if you're the leader. Men, if you're at your homes, don't let things just go on. It is sometimes our nature to want to let things go, but those things come back to bite us. Jacob was a passive leader. He heard that his oldest son slept with his wife, and he didn't do anything about it. Now, in Genesis chapter 49, we're going to read this. This is when Jacob is calling to bless his sons. This is when he's on his deathbed. Jacob calls to bless his sons. He says, assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Jacob didn't do anything then, but he never forgot it. He never forgot it. And I think part of the reason, again, aside from the fact that they had grain at the time, but part of the reason why he did not let Benjamin go was that he didn't have respect for Reuben because of what Reuben had done. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5, when it's giving the, the account of the children of Israel, it talks about Reuben being the firstborn of Jacob, but he says, but he won't get the rights of the firstborn because he went up to his father's bed and defiled it. So Jacob hears, he does nothing, doesn't forget, but because of that, I think that's one of the reasons why this, he does not let him go when Reuben says it. Well, we're back to the story here at the present time. There he is. He's going to let them go. He says, finally, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go with him. So here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. I want you to take verse 11. Israel says to them, if it must be so, again, he's very reluctant. If it must be so, if you've got to go, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man. A little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and rise and go to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. I wish he would have stopped just before that sentence, because it, it felt as though he was, he was giving it to God. It felt as though he was saying, God, it's in your hands, and I trust you. That's what it almost sounded like. But then he goes, and if I'm bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved. If they all die, they all die. That's not faith. It's fatalism. Saying whatever happens, it just happens. There's a big difference between having faith in God and saying, you know what, whatever happens, I'm going to be all right because I trust in the hands of an almighty God who loves me. There's a big difference between that and saying, whatever happens, happens. It's not the same thing. And I wish that Jacob was, was showing this faith here. I wish he was saying, you know what, the God who protected me and the God who provides for me and the God who promised things to me, I'm going to put my trust and faith in him. I'm going to say, God, yes, I believe in you no matter what. God, I see your hand in what's going on here. I may not understand it, but I know that you're working. That's not what Jacob's saying. He's saying, go and whatever happens, happens. Hope it works out. There's a huge difference between that and putting our faith and trust in Christ. We talked about it, we sang about it earlier, that it's so sweet to trust in Jesus. It's good it's wonderful to be able to put your faith, to put your trust in someone that you know is not going to abuse it. Someone that you know has your best interests at heart. Someone that you know that loves you and would do anything for you because he gave his son to die for you. God gave his son his very best, the one he loved, to die for us. Did we deserve that? Could we ever deserve that? Certainly not. 
But he did it anyway, and it's because of his great love for us that he does that. If he would give Jesus, what else would he withhold from us? Nothing. We can trust him because we know what he has already done. We know what he's done, and we can put our faith and our trust in him. Jacob says, if you've got to go, go. But here's what I want you to do. We're going to take a present, all the choice fruits of the land, and some myrrh and some pistachios and some almonds, take this all, and take double the money with you. I mentioned before, sometimes when we find ourselves in stressful situations, what we want to do is we want to fall back on old habits. What did Jacob do when he was about to meet Esau for the first time in 20 years? He stole the blessing, he stole the birthright, and he got out of Dodge. He went away to his uncle Laban, and he was gone for 20 years. And now he's finally going to meet his brother for the first time in 20 years. The last time he was with his brother, his brother says he was comforting himself with the thought that he was going to kill him. So what does Jacob do when he's about to meet him? He sends this huge present across the river first in front of him. He sends all of his servants, he sends cattle, and he sends sheep, and he sends goats, and he sends all these choice fruits and stuff over to Esau in front. And then, as we know, Jacob likes to play favorites, he lines up his wives and children in order of importance to him. He puts puts Zilpha and her kids up first, and then Billah and her kids up, and then Leah and her children and then last, Rachel and hers. And I said the last time, and I was incorrect, I said that he sent them in front of him. He went first, but he had them lined up in that order so that if Esau was coming after them, the ones he loved the most, Rachel and Joseph, would be in the back, and they'd have the best chance to get away. But he sent the gift out in front, and it seemed to work because him and Esau, they buried the hatchet and they were fine. So now... When he has to have his younger son, Benjamin, go back to Egypt, he says, all right, send a gift. Falling back on the old habits, I'm not going to trust in God. I'm just going to send a gift and do it my way, and hopefully it works. And he sends the gift on ahead as a pledge. And so they leave. They take double the money with them, and they go back, and they take the present, and they go down, and they stood before Joseph. And just to read on the rest of this chapter, because it is a little... Fairly long, but we'll get through the rest of it. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, this is verse 16, he said to the steward of his house, bring the men into the house. Slaughter an animal, make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys." Let me just say it for a second here. Fear makes you irrational. Fear will make you irrational. Okay? We see it with Jacob. Jacob said, oh, no. Joseph is no more. Simeon's already dead. There's no way you're taking my son. And they stay there, and they eat almost all the grain until they have to go back. And I always say this, Simeon was still in jail. Simeon was in jail all this time waiting for to see his brothers come back because he's trying to get out. Here, the brothers come back. They've done exactly what the man said. They brought their other brother with them, but they're being told to come to the house of, the, of this, the prime minister. They're being brought to his home. They don't know why. And so everything's going on in their heads, and they're fearful, and they know that this is it. He's going to kill us, he's going to make, or he's going to make us his servants. He's going to take all of our stuff. He's going to keep us here with him. And so they decide, let's see if we can get in here with the steward. And they talk to the steward. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke to him at the door of the house and said, Oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us. And... We have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, peace to you, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money, which wasn't a lie. He did receive the money, but then he put it back in. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. He brought Simeon out to them, and when the man had brought 
them, them into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when they had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that he should eat bread there. If you can picture this, they get to Joseph's house, they find out that, they, that Joseph wants to come eat with them, and the, they want to rush to get this gift looking good. I mean, if they had wrapping paper back then, they'd have wrapped it up pretty and put a bow on it. They want it to be so good because whatever they present to Joseph, they think is going to take care of them. They're worried that Joseph is angry with them and that he's looking to punish them. And they want to do whatever they can to placate him. They want to give him this gift. They want to present what they have brought. And they want that to be the thing that gives them peace with Joseph. Little do they know, their peace with Joseph is not going to be based on what they can bring. It's going to be based on a person. Their peace, their salvation, the grace that is being shown to them is being done so because of a person and their relationship with that person. Joseph is their brother. They don't know that. Joseph wants to do good to them. Joseph wants to bless them. Joseph wants to see if they've repented. And Joseph wants to bring the whole family down so that they can be here in Egypt while the famine continues. They don't know that, though. And they think that what they give, they think that what they bring in their own efforts is what's going to bring, bridge the gap between them and this great prime minister of Egypt who has brought them into his house. Well, let's continue to read. Verse 25, 26, excuse me. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground, once again fulfilling Joseph's dream that his brothers would bow in front of him. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber, and he wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. They served him by himself, and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken from them to Joseph's table. But Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs, and they drank, and they were merry with him. It's a fun story. We know the end of it, most of us, so it's hard to, to build the suspense as it would have been in that time. But Joseph comes, and they have this huge present, and they want to present it to him, and Joseph, it doesn't even seem as though he had any interest in them. How's your father? the old man of whom you spoke. Is he well? Is he still alive? He wants to hear news at home. News of his father, is he still alive? Yes, our father, your servant, is still alive. He is well. And that's what Joseph wants to hear. They don't understand or they don't know yet the relationship that's there. Their salvation is going to be based on that relationship, based on the relationship. Our salvation is based on the relationship. It's not in things. It's not in what we can do or what we can bring or what we can achieve or what we look like. But it is in a person, Jesus, and our relationship to him. That's where salvation comes from. Not in what we can do or what we can do, bring. And they, he wants to find out about his father, and he does, and he seats them according to their ages. And one commentator said the odds of, of putting these 11 men in order was one in 40 million. And I, I don't know if that number is right, but <laughs> I was trusting his math. One in 40 million that he would get this right on the first shot. And they looked at each other in amazement. How did this happen? We don't know what's going on here. Maybe this guy over here, something about him. 
Yeah, it's your brother. He knows you. Well, he gives Benjamin five times as much to eat as he gives to the other brothers. Why does he do this? My thought is that he would like to see how they react to their younger brother being treated better than them. The last time there was a younger brother who was being treated better than them, they ripped off his coat, beat him, put him in a pit, and sold him as a slave. How will they react now when something happens? And we'll see it next time in chapter 44, but they stand up for Benjamin. These men have changed somewhat in how they react. They're being changed. They're being, they've repented somewhat of how they've treated him because they will not treat Benjamin in the same way. We'll see that the next time. But here we are. Joseph has his brothers in front of him. They return with all of their money. So they brought 10 units of silver the first time. They bring 10 more this time along with those. That's 20 units of silver. Everything's coming full circle. How much did Joseph get sold for? 20 pieces of silver. And they, that's exactly what they bring back this time as well. They have that there. They come, and they're in Joseph's presence, but they don't know who he is, of course. They don't know who he is. Joseph does know who he is. What is the big picture? What's been going on here? For 400 years, they were going to be slaves in a foreign land. After that, the Bible tells us God told Abram that they would come out of this foreign land, they would come out of Egypt, and they would come out with much treasure. How are they going to end up in this foreign land in the first place? Well, this particular set of circumstances. This is how they get there. How many times in our lives would we have made changes unless circumstances forced us to? As people, generally speaking, we don't like to change. How did I end up in Syracuse? I was a complete New York City chauvinist. I thought everything in New York was the best, Everything in New York was better than any place else you could possibly be. And matter of fact, why would you even want to go anywhere else? My sister went to college in, at the University of Albany, and I would go up to Albany. I said, this is a terrible, hick town. This is like a two-cow town. Why are you here? What in the world is in Albany? I said, they've got the Capitol building, and they've got a mall. And I used to rag on her all the time. And so, of course, I got it back when I ended up moving to Syracuse. <laughs> now, of course... I wouldn't have come here on my own. Circumstances made me come. My, my, my employer was moving, and they were either going to go to Charlotte, North Carolina, or to Syracuse. Did I want to stay? Did I want to try and find another job? I decided I was going to come to Syracuse. Now, again, I would not have made this decision all on my own. The circumstances made it happen. And look, I got here, I got a wife and four kids, so it's a good thing. Now. Why would the children of Israel ever have gone to Egypt? Because of this famine, this terrible circumstance that nobody would have wanted and nobody could have predicted is what brought them from where they were into Egypt. But what happens there? In Egypt, they come to the most racially, what's the word I'm looking for? The most, the most racial, I should say, society in the world at the time. The Egyptians would not even eat with other people because they believed they were descended from the gods and everybody else was lower. They wouldn't even have a meal with them. Even Joseph, this great prime minister, it tells us here that he had ate at one table, his brothers ate at one table, and the Egyptians who were with them, they ate at another table. They would not eat with them. And so they get 400 years. They come with 70 people. They have 400 years. They become a nation of a couple of million people, and they haven't had even the opportunity to intermarry with the people around them. Had they stayed in Canaan, they most surely would have intermarried with the people around them, and things would have been different. But God uses that circumstance to bring them to a place where they can be their own people. God uses the circumstances of our lives in the exact same way. He does so. He brings us through things to bring us to himself. He brings us through things to make us more like Christ. He brings us through things 
so that we can be changed and that we can have the Holy Spirit work through us and have us trust in him even more. Does that include COVID-19? Yeah, it does. Does it include possible unemployment and being home for six weeks at a time? Yes, it does. God is working no matter what the situation or circumstance is. If you believe that we have a loving Heavenly Father, then it, puts, it makes it so much easier for us to put our trust and our faith and our very lives in his hand, knowing that he is working for our good. This story I absolutely love, and we come to the, the end of this chapter today, and I want you to think about the fact that these men thought that their salvation could be bought. They thought that their salvation could be in the things that they did, the things that they could produce. And our lives, many of our friends and our coworkers and our family members feel the same way, that it's because I'm a good person or it's because I do good things or it's because I gave to this charity that maybe I will go to heaven, that maybe God will accept me. But it's not in what we do. It's in who we know. For these brothers... They think that they're going to either be enslaved or or they may starve to death if they can't get grain, and they put their faith in what they could bring, but it was about the person. It was about the person. Joseph was their means of salvation because of their relationship with him. For us as people, it's the exact same thing. Our salvation is not in the things that we can do, bring, or we can achieve, but it's in a person. It's in the person of Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. The only way we can have a relationship with Jesus is because of his death on the cross. His death on the cross pays for our sin. Our sin is put on Jesus. Jesus' righteousness is put on us, and we can have a right relationship with the Father again because of what Jesus has done. If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your means of salvation, I ask that you would do that today. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus that brings salvation to us. If you are struggling, if you don't understand what's going on, if you don't know what's going to happen next like none of us do, put your faith in the one who does. There is someone who knows all about you and loves you nonetheless. His name is Jesus. He died on a cross to save you from your sin and from the wrath of God. And you can have a right relationship with him today if you would just put your faith and trust in him. If you would like to get in contact with us, you can do so on our website, on our Facebook page. You can even send an email to the church or call the church number, and we'll be happy to talk to you about how you can get to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We're going to close in prayer now, and I'm going to have the worship team come back up, and we're going to close. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us. We know that we are undeserving of what you've given to us, and we don't think for a moment that we could be worthy of what you've given. We thank you, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. And we're so grateful, Heavenly Father, that we can have a right relationship with you because of what Christ has done. We pray, Lord, for those of us who who do know you as personal Savior, that we will be able to put our trust and our faith in you in a total, in a more way. We just ask, Lord, that, you know, we, we believe, help our unbelief. Help us, Lord, to just seek you more and to go hard after you. We just ask, Heavenly Father, now that you would have these words just resonate in our hearts and our minds. And, Lord, help us to, to live for you day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, Lord, I do. I never need to worry, and I might not make it through because I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, Lord, I do. Because I know you love me, I will always trust you. Sing it again. Trust you, I trust you, I trust you, Lord, I do. I never need to worry that I might not make it through because I trust you, I trust you.
trust you, I trust you, Lord, I do. to know that we can trust in our Savior. I pray that that's what you will do today as you leave here, as you leave us online, and as you leave us where you are, that you will find a way to put your trust in Christ today. Have a great afternoon.